This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. So, welcome to our third talk in the second session in this room today. Christian Teume is going to answer a question of general interest, why things break and why it is hard to fix them. Please give him a warm welcome. All right. Thank you. Um, glad that you made it. Um, if I wouldn't be giving a talk, I would probably be upstairs waiting for the lunch. Um, my name is Christian. Uh, I'm working for the Flying Circus. You might have heard of it. We do hosting and operations for our applications, web applications, all kinds of stuff. Um, and that's why I get into contact with uh, shit that breaks. Um, so the question is, why do things break? Um, and the answer to that is quite easy to give. It's because it's obviously entropy um, and insufficient quality, right? So um, what do we do against that? We do more quality. And how do we, do, how do we improve quality? More process, um, right? Uh, so that basically means working harder. And that is like the right thing for our industry, just like more of the same. Maybe not. Um, let's look around uh, things that broke for me roughly in the last year. Um, here's an example. Um, I maintain a small package in my spare time called Pi Country. Did some, does anybody use that, actually? No? Perfect. Oh, yeah, do you do. I know that Reddit used it for a while. Um, so, and it's, basic, it's basically something where you can, uh, we, we have like data about which countries exist and languages and stuff like that. And uh, I expose a Python API for that. And I have to regularly update that from XML databases that Debian has. And the last year was for me uh, very much uh, under the influence of my uh, newly born child. So I was happy that PyCountry was mostly on autopilot. Whenever an update came out, I just press a button. Uh, and I get the new database and I do the release and blah, blah, blah in five minutes. Um, somewhere in between, the upstream guys decided to switch from XML to JSON. And actually, at that point, my import script failed because obviously there's no XML anymore. And I didn't have any time or energy to update that. So that mean, meant that little change broke all of my update chain. And I didn't have any energy to update that until like five days ago. Um, and so no PyCountry updates anymore. Uh, great. Um, Another thing that broke on me is Varnish. Um, if Varnish, you know Varnish, right? Who does not know Varnish? Excellent. Okay, so that, that's a cache, an HTTP cache um, for speeding things up. Varnish, when the disk I.O. stops for some reason, like your underlying storage system that just goes on vacation for a few minutes, um, at some point it decides that the worker process doesn't really respond anymore and it kills it, but because the uh, the disk is still not responding, it can't even start a new one. And at that point, it just sits there. Uh, the problem is, it still keeps the socket open, and all the monitoring will think like everything's there because the process runs and it's got a port open, and then like half a day later, you notice like, okay, it's not actually doing anything. <laughs> um, another thing in Varnish that broke for me was, we suddenly got uh, error pages out of a specific client's installation. Um, whenever images were served. And we find, found out that when Varnish tries to cache an image, or cache an object, like anything, and it's too big, and your working set has very different sizes because you're caching HTML and big images, uh, and it needs to make room for the image, it's going to stop at some point after evicting a number of objects. And if you try to cache a five megabyte object, and its standard limit is like, I'm, I'm evicting at most 10 objects to get a new one in, and it evicts 10 HTML pages that are obviously much smaller than a 5 megabit image, then it's not going to just deliver the image uncached. It's going to say, nope, nope, can't have the image. Great. Um, we had one customer where you could uh, upload news items into some internet kind of thingy. And because they had a very stressful situation because an actual disaster, including uh, danger of loss of life for humans, uh, was involved, uh, people got really stressed like in the middle of the night and they uploaded a, uh, a news item that didn't have an image attached to it. Um, and that was on purpose. So the form uh, supported explicitly not uploading an image. However, on the other end of the system, the dashboard that was displaying those uh, had a bug that would just completely fail 
if there was no image, because nobody ever did that, not uploading an image. Uh, and obviously, some test is going to fail, and that failed. And so under the stressful situation of having a danger of hum uh, loss of human life situation, just forgetting to upload an image caused everybody to get locked out of the internet in the middle of the night. And obviously, in that situation, they, fo they forgot to uh, call us using the SLA hotline. They just sent an email to me personally on Sunday morning, 3 AM. We had a customer that was, is doing daily MySQL imports by downloading a CSV file. And uh, our cluster uh, is always struggling with disk I.O. Uh, I always like the worst thing in life for anybody operating large storage clusters. Um, and at some point, we had to introduce uh, limits. And we limited it to like 1,000 I.O.s per second, uh, which is quite high if you have an actually just only 30 or 40 gigabyte disk, right? And we noticed that at that point, the CSV import would actually take down the site for like half an hour every morning. And the import was built in a way that it actually not, uh, uh, doesn't take the site down. Um, it does some weird thing of, okay, import the CSV file into a table and then do a select update into the other table and truncate it and turn it around and stuff like that. Turned out, if it was always consuming like five or 6,000 IOs and got done quite fast, but when we limited it, it took a long time. And actually, MySQL was introducing read logs all the time so that it actually <laughs> blocked on all the regular requests. Um, and the point is, this complicated thing was actually introduced to avoid taking the site down during import. Um, we usually have failures when we install servers with, with automated scripts uh, because the next server that we buy is always a little bit different than the one before. Switch trunks, we had like two different vendors uh, in the data center with switches and it worked for like two years and suddenly with a bug that we never repeat, the switches would decide that a trunk connection where you have two cables between two switches uh, which you need specific protocol support for decided that this isn't the way to go. Uh, they disabled that weird trunk and then they started having uh, weird, weird protocols um, for negotiating which, which of these should not form a loop. And because it was two vendors, they always, both switches always decided, I'm going to disable this one, the other one, I'm going to disable that one. Okay, so that means no leak. Okay, so let's re-enable them. And then they said, wait, 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 it's a loop again. Let's disable it that way. And it kept going back and forth. And it took us like two hours to diagnose that because our network became completely blind. We had a failed hard drive that uh, uh, we wanted to get to the office uh, from the data center uh, for further diagnostics. And because the data center kind of got into, in the person that kind of got into the loop, okay, we had a couple of exchanges of uh, replacement hardware that needs to get, uh, get sent back to the vendor. They had, they had an additional sticker for sending things out. And it was like, okay, send it back. And, and then the hard drive that had actually customer data ended up at the vendor. Uh, so we had to have to call them, it's like, there's going to be a package that please, you do not open, you just put it in a bigger box <laughs> and you send it back to us. And also this week we had a humongous Ceph outage where the actual failure was a, a broken disk and Ceph itself shut the daemon down and that was fine, like nothing happened. But somebody else recognized, hey, there's a Ceph server down, let's start it again. And at that point, it started delivering wrong data into the cluster because the RAID controller decided like, yeah, I saw a failure, but like that was three days ago, I don't care. Let's start fresh, let's just use that data that's in here. Uh, and while we were fixing things there, we, we, we fixed them worse over like three or four days. All right, okay, so shit breaks all the time. Um, and over the last year, I kept getting into a kind of existential crisis mode every now and then, um, which was also supported by way too much caffeine. Uh, I had to keep asking myself, like, okay, damn, what am I doing here? It's like, I'm supposed to be smart. I mean, I got tested for that. And still, stuff always breaks around me when I try to make decisions that do the right thing under adverse conditions. And I, I regularly wonder whether I should just become like a chef or a baker or something like that. And at some point, I stumbled over Dave's work, um, and he's Welsh, and he's a really good guy. And um, I rediscovered his thoughts on complexity and something called Kinevrin. Um, and all of the things that I'm going to say up from now is everything that makes sense and sounds like wisdom, that's his. Um, and all the confu confusing things and all the stupid stuff, that's mine, all right? Um, because I also use his wording to describe that system, because I can't think of a better way to describe it. Uh, and I hope he doesn't mind that. Um, I'd rather copy him uh, than get things out wrong and then you attribute that back to him. 
Um, okay, let's look at Knewin. Um, it's written uh, like in the first line and it's pronounced like in the second, second line, it's Welsh. Uh, it means a place of multiple belongings, um, which means that people are, are rooted in multiple pasts that they can only ever be aware of partially in any, uh, in any moment. Um, it also points to uh, not having a full understanding of something. And Dave is thinking about um, how to manage under conditions of uncertainty and rapid change. Um, and the idea there is you have to solve problems and there is no one-size-fits-all one size, fits, one size fits all process for all problems, right? Um, so he tried to come up with a way to finding the most appropriate uh, problem-solving process for a specific situation. Um, Canarin is a model um, and you can look at it from two perspectives, either for categorization, so um, that you can actually um, use what the model has, exploit the model for um, getting a fast answer how to deal with things. Um, however, uh, using it as a categorization model uh, means that you can easily lose subtle differences because you want to make a fast decision. Um, and that is not useful during periods of change. Um, it's also a, what he calls a sense-making model, uh, where you have the data first, you get all the data you need, uh, and then you use that model as a social process uh, to come up with new solutions uh, or fitting solutions. Um, and these two models, they, they, they can be interchanged, but you have to be careful and have to have in the back of your mind that these are two different aspects to, uh, to the model. Okay, so here's the model. Um, the model act actually exists of three basic systems, uh, ordered, complex and chaotic. Um, ordered is split into obvious and complicated, and uh, the obvious thing is where cause and effect relationships exist, are predictable and are repeatable. Uh, they can be determined in advance, and the relationship is obvious to any reasonable person. Uh, that's why we call it self-evident. Um, the actions that you have there are sense, categorize, respond. You see what's coming in, uh, you make it fit any predetermined category, uh, you decide what you do and you do it. Uh, an example of that is best practices, uh, which is leg legitimate there, but not in other domains. Um, it's got a high level of constraints, um, cause and effect, predictable, repeatable, as I said, and if we do the same thing again, we get the same result again. Um, that is good for industry, for business process reengineering, there's stuff like the Six Sigma guys do. And this gives stability in areas where it's appropriate. The complicated thing is where cause and effect relationships still exist uh, and there is a right answer, but it's not self-evident anymore and it requires expertise. So you do have to apply an analytical method, you have to sense, analyze, respond, and that means you need experts in a domain to make a decision and you apply good practice instead of best practice. Uh, in the complicated domain, uh, there's several different ways to doing things and all of these are legitimate if you have the right expertise. Forcing people to adopt exactly one of these ways, like as best practice, is dangerous because you actually train people to become annoyed up to a point where they won't apply best practice, where that's actually useful. The complex uh, systems are without causality. Uh, cause and effect are only obvious in hindsight. You can't predict them anymore. Uh, you've got light constraints with agents, and these agents actually modify the system. Um, the decision model there is probe, sense, respond. Uh, you, cr you, you create fail-safe experiments, um, and you don't do fail-safe design. Um, and if your experiment succeeds, you amplify it, and if the experiment fa starts to fail, you dampen it. And you shouldn't perform experiments in that domain uh, without identifying first your amplification and dampening strategies. Uh, out of that, you get emergent order, uh, new ways of doing things, and those can be combinations of existing things, but they're different and uh, they're unique. Chaotic environments are relatively rare uh, in the natural um, uh, environment, but they exist and they can be induced. Um, that these environments are uh, characterized by extreme instability. Uh, you do not have cause and effect relationships that we as humans can determine. Uh, you can enter that kind of domain deliberately uh, for innovation, but if you enter it accidentally, then you need to stabilize quickly. Uh, the decision model is therefore act, sense, respond and because you have to move very quick uh, to stabilize the situation. And anything you do there will be completely novel in the way that things work. And this framework, this, this can decide you in what mode to work. You can determine which space you're in, and that means you can determine which way to think and which way to analyze. 
Um, there's a fifth area in the middle, um, looks like a little uh, cell, um, where that's called disorder. And this, this order is key. It means when we don't know where we are. And um, this is the normal space that everybody works in. And the problem is that everybody has a personal preference. So for example, bureaucrats, they, they tend to live in the obvious space. Uh, every, pro every problem they encounter is a problem of, uh, is a failure of process. Uh, deep experts, on the other hand, they live in the complicated space. Any problem for them means they haven't had enough time and resources to do a proper analysis. Um, complexity workers, like politicians or like battlefield commanders, they respond to crisis by getting lots of different people together and getting lots of different background input. And the chaotic environment is where actually fascists uh, thrive. Because under chaotic environments, uh, they, they can assume full power. It's so like everybody will just give up and like, hey, you do what you want to do. And um, it's good to, to learn to switch quickly between these methods. Um, so you can use that framework to say, wait, 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 this, is, this, this doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Categorize, think about it, and then say, hey, we can't, we can't apply uh, an, obvious pro an obvious problem solution to a complicated problem. Um, and at the bottom, the border between obvious and chaotic is very important. Um, if you believe for a certain thing that, for a certain problem, that uh, things are simple and ordered, uh, then you start to believe in, in the success that you get. Like you do the same thing over and over and you get success. However, uh, you also get complacent, you get lazy. And the other boundaries between the other areas, they allow for smooth transitions. You slowly notice that things change. But in the obvious environment, if, you're, if your outside world changes, uh, you have rigid processes that become fragile under stress because it's not that something doesn't work exactly right, like it gets slower or it's not, not as good anymore, but it, it, it moves over to the chaotic domain immediately. So the recommendation here is you should always prefer to manage in the complex and the complicated space. And you should only move very, very small uh, amounts of your work into the, into the uh, simple and obvious area. And that you have to monitor actually close because under rapid change, under stress, these things tend to break in a, in a chaotic mesh, uh, uh, fashion. Um, I've got a couple of reflections that I, that I gathered from like hours of his talks and I can really recommend watching them. Uh, first, even though we don't like that, pretty much everything is a complex system today. Um, and complex systems means that they are actually networks of loosely coupled agents that co-evolute. And co-evolution means that you don't have causal interdependencies, but every, everything has a, has a tendency, and those tendencies, they, they produce effects over time. Uh, it's also, it also means that it's not about process and order anymore. It means, because what, everything that I listed in the beginning, the failures that I see over a year, nothing ever happens twice. I can't go there and say, I'm going to, I'm going to ensure that this doesn't happen again, because this doesn't happen again anyway. Because that, it's, it's such a complex situation how failure gets created nowadays. Um, and so instead of process and order, it's more about finding strategies to, uh, to cope with uncertainty. Um, he, has, he also has a nice uh, perspective on carbon versus silicon. Okay, so our brains are carbon based, right? And the computers are based on silicon. And the whole idea that computers and silicon will evolve into the singularity where we can upload our brains is probably not right. Um, and we shouldn't think about that. Uh, we use silicon to replace what humans do, but we need to think about how to augment the deficiencies that humans have with technology. And the social cost of uh, using technology to replace human stuff is actually quite high. And there was a, uh, there was an, uh, th there's a, um, <sighs> missing a word, eine um, Beobachtung. There, there's the observation that actually intelligence on, a gener uh, on, a, on an evolutionary level can change within two generations genetically. And, and if, we, if we keep uh, replacing intelligent stuff with mechanical, uh, th technological things, we do actually, as, a, as humanity, have the danger that intelligence will devolve. Um, and and why, why, did, why is this uh, augmentation thing important? It's because Humans are pattern-based intelligences. We're not information processing machines, right? And if we, if we treat it that way, we are actually fighting evolution there. Um, and our brain doesn't like that. Actually thinking hard and doing things different than usually requires a lot of energy. 
And your brain doesn't want that. Your brain always wants to go into a mode where you can do pattern matching. And the pattern matching has the problem that the human pattern matching doesn't work with the best fit. It works with the first fit. Whatever matches, your brain is going to apply the solution that it trained. And when that actually succeeds, it's going to mark that pattern as even more important. It keeps reinforcing that. And giving more information to people doesn't even help because we only consume 5% anyway. Um, so augmentation. Um, you need to manage things also as a whole. Uh, we treat software development still a lot like ma a manufacturing process. Um, and so that means we break things down, we make we have a problem, we break it down to smaller parts, we solve the smaller parts, we reassemble that into the bigger thing. However, in complex situations, you can't see the patterns in the smaller things. This is kind of like, if I only fix all the bugs, then everything will be perfect, but you actually have to think about the big system that has structural problems that you can't fix by just fixing all, this, all, the, all the bugs of the small parts, right? And that also, also means that a typical engineering solution of imagining, okay, if we just build it this way, this is like, we, we learn what the current situation is, and you know this would be the perfect feature. If we built the, the storage cluster this way, uh, then, then everything would be perfect, and you start moving toward that. And the problem is that once you start moving towards that, you are already modifying uh, the environment. Your agents are already starting to exhibit new behavior that you cannot have known when you actually drafted that ideal. And running, running uh, after the ideal will actually make you blind towards uh, the small inputs that you get. Okay, Outlook. Uh, I have one minute. How did we fix that MySQL thing where the import blocked everything? Well, we implemented a very, very stupid solution that just instead of shuffling data around, we just import the table now, drop the old table, except that we have about 50 milliseconds of unavailability, rename the table, no I.O. is needed anymore at all, uh, and we actually have factual uptime that is much higher uh, than the theoretical uptime that we should have had. Um, with Seth, uh, I actually just thought about the situation we, ha we had this, this week and we noticed that dropping the ideal state thing that you always want, like all the disks should be okay and green and monitoring should be right, is actually helping me right now because we're now drafting how to replace uh, disks with uh, hard drives with SSDs. And because we didn't touch failed disks for a while, we now have disks that are not being used. I can just rip them out, I can put the next generation drives in and I don't have to do additional operational work. And this is, this is just because we actually started getting lazy there and not going like every, every nitty gritty detail. 10, sec oh, ten seconds over. Um, watch Dave's videos. Um, I can really recommend that. Thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. We have some time for questions, please. Go ahead. Um, how do you find the balance between uh, like going away from the ideal state and just going into complete chaos? Because if, 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 you, if you want to stick with the ideal state, you have to probably subscribe. Right. So you have to be like. Right. Okay, so the question was uh, when I mentioned that we don't want to strive for ideal state all the time, um, how do we avoid uh, uh, getting driven off over into the chaotic state? Uh, first, uh, just by accepting that. So first, uh, trying to stay on the ideal state makes you do a lot of work that you try to automate and move into the obvious space. Which means you're always working um, in a way that is bound to drive over to chaotic anyway. So, so that's the first thing you have to realize is that what you consider ideal state is actually quite suboptimal regarding the risks that you're uh, facing. And the other is you can actually then use the space that you get uh, by not being like in this nitty gritty detail work all the time. You can use that space to say, okay, instead of changing a disk like when it fails, because that means like on Tuesday morning somebody has to diagnose that, has to order the replacement, on Wednesday it gets shipped, coordinate with the remote hands, get it built in, watch the cluster rebuilding. You just do that for like four or six weeks. You, mon you still monitor and alert for like really bad situations. But then you say, okay, and every two months, we just do a sweep. And we say, okay, let's gather all of these and uh, do that in one, in, one, uh, in one session. And you can decide, hey, I've got a much bigger picture now. I can actually see like, okay, it's like I got eight, eight disks there. Instead of like always working on the, the nitty gritty detail. It gives, you the, it gives you the ability to watch from a higher perspective. OK, 
Okay, everybody wants to yeah. get through so, that thing. Yeah, everyone, <laughs> <laughs> everyone is constraining himself because he, they want to go to have lunch. Yes, feel free to do so. Thank you. Sessions will continue at 3 p.m.